And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal, the full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning. Welcome to the show. It's uh, 6.06 as we get this uh, Tuesday, Wednesday. What day is this? I'm not even sure anymore. Wednesday edition of the show. Uh, yesterday, of course, we apologized. There was no show yesterday because we had no power. Um, not sure exactly what happened, but apparently it's a commodity shortage. <laughs> so, yeah, electricity. <laughs> yes. So uh, we apologize for not being here yesterday, but uh, back again today. Lots of stuff to get into this morning as, um, you know, we kind of start, you know, getting ready to move into the middle of the month. As uh, this month just kind of ticks by already. Uh, lots of Fed speakers coming up. We're going to get the FOMC uh, latest release of minutes. And one of the things that we're looking for there, and this was one of the things that really kind of spooked the markets yesterday, was Lael Brainerd came out and said, and of course she's now going to be you know, part of the Federal Reserve Permanent Voting Committee for the FOMC. And she said that uh, we need to have a much faster runoff of the balance sheet. And, and, and I was doing a uh, podcast yesterday um, talking a little bit about this. And, and this is an important aspect to understand is that when the Fed talks about draining their balance sheet, right? It's like, oh, my gosh, quantitative tightening. What, you know, this is going to be terrible, right? They're going to be just selling all of their bonds into the markets. And, you know, this is cause interest rates to spike because there's going to be no buyers for bonds. Uh, be careful with that. First of all, there's several things that are going to happen here. First is that a lot of the bonds that the Treasury has been buying for their quantitative easing program over the last couple of years have been very short-dated maturities. So these bonds are already starting to mature and roll off. And right now, all the Fed is doing is that as a bond matures, it buys another one and replaces it. So the balance sheet kind of stays flat. But that will change starting in May, as they begin to not replace those bonds. And that will now allow the balance sheet to decline. But that doesn't put more inventory into the markets, right? But it does remove a buyer because now when the Treasury wants to fund something like their excessive spending, <laughs> they have to do that in debt. Well, when the Treasury issue, issues bonds, the what we call the primary dealers. These are the major banks in the country. They're the ones that actually buy the bonds from the Treasury. That's what gives the government the money to spend in excess of what they bring in in revenue. The banks then have a couple of choices. They can either hold the bonds themselves. They can sell them to individuals, pension funds, you know, corporations, whoever wants them. Or they can sell them to the Fed. Back in the day used to be that it, the, the banks would hold these bonds for a period of time it's called aging. They would age these bonds before they would sell them. That used to be a couple-week period. Now it's almost an immediate transfer. The banks buy them and immediately sell them to the Fed. And this is QE. The Fed now... This is also where mother, another kind of misnomer comes up because everybody goes, well, the Fed's printing money. No, they're not printing money. The Federal Reserve does an asset swap with the banks. The banks have the bonds. The Federal Reserve has the reserve accounts for the banks. So the Federal Reserve credits the reserve account for the value of the bond, and there's an asset swap. Banks get the, the reserve credit. Federal Reserve gets the bond. So this is why that never created inflation as much as the hand-wringing was about over the last decade or so because there wasn't really money printing. Now, in 2020, why do we have inflation today? Well, it's not because of the Fed. It's because of the government. 
government decides to basically send out $5 trillion worth of liquidity through enhanced benefits, child, you know, uh, tax, you know, tax checks to houses, all these type of things, unemployment benefits. That's direct money into households that turned around that they spent at a time when we shut down economic production, so your demand is greater than your supply. That's why you have inflation. It has nothing to do with the Fed. So the Fed is, is about to start reducing their balance sheet. Now, that's got impacts for the markets, absolutely, because it's going to reduce liquidity supply in markets. Less, the, the banks use those excess reserves for prop trading, whatever they're going to do with it. Money finds its way into the markets. But there's also a psychological connection between the excess or between QE and the markets. Markets have now been trained that when the Federal Reserve does QE, you buy stocks. The opposite logic also exists that when the Fed's not doing QE, you shouldn't buy stocks, right? And so this is why there's likely going to be a bit more turmoil in markets as we go forward. But this is, this is going to be emblematic of the problem that the Fed faces now is that every time they begin to hike rates and reduce their balance sheet, a problem results that requires them to go back to low interest rates and doing more QE. So the question now becomes, what is it that's coming down the pipeline? What is it that's going to cause the next crisis in the markets that the Fed's going to have to bail out? And I actually just kind of wrote an article on this a couple of weeks ago talking about bailouts are ruining capitalism. And the problem has become that we don't allow people to fail. As soon as somebody gets into trouble, we start to bail them out one way or the other. And this, this removes the value, that Darwinistic process of capitalism, where weak players fail and strong players survive. And we've changed that dynamic over the last 12 years because we've now decided that, you know, crises and recessions and these things, they're, they're bad and we can't have those happen. But in trying to prevent those crises, we're now creating crises more often by not allowing the capitalistic process to work. And there's another crisis now that's brewing on the horizon that may be showing up much sooner than later. In other words, we may find the Fed dropping rates and doing and going back to QE even sooner than expected. But we'll talk about that after the break because it's going to take a little bit of a explanation to understand how this dynamic works and why there's a potential problem brewing on the horizon. Now, this doesn't mean the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination, but it does have some implications into Federal Reserve policy, monetary policy, etc. And there's a there are kind of interesting comments that, well, you know, nominal GDP is growing at like 5%. That's true. Well, it was growing at 5%. That, that growth is going to quickly decline because the liquidity that was driving it is now gone. The growth was not organic, it was artificial. And now that the artificial inputs are gone and aren't coming back anytime soon, we're going to see that growth rate reverse fairly quickly. We'll come back, we'll talk about the next financial crisis and why the Federal Reserve may be doing QE sooner than later, right after the break. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. We're all impacted by the significance of the passage of time, especially when it comes to signing up for Medicare. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premiums? Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for our next virtual lunch and learn on Medicare, avoiding pitfalls and permanent penalties. Thursday, April 21st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare. Realinvestmentadvice.com. 
Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Do you know what you don't know when hiring and retaining quality employees? Compensation is more than just wages. It's personal time off. The vacation days, healthcare benefits, a 401k. Do you know what's important to them? Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable, effective package that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So the next financial crisis, where is it coming from and what's going to cause it? And it's going to be an interesting one, I think. Now, this is pure speculation on my part, but I'm just watching a few things that are going on. And, you know, there's a couple of things that kind of jump out as being concerning, I should say. And, and there's already some wheels in motion, I should say, that are kind of pointing to this one area of the markets that may be needing a bailout sooner than later. And that's the commodities market. We wrote out this article a couple of weeks ago talking about, about bailouts and you know how those bailouts are ruining capitalism. They're on the website now at realinvestmentadvice.com. And the problem with with bailouts, of course, as I was saying a second ago, is that it eliminates the Darwinistic nature of capitalism and eliminating the ability to get rid of weak players so that strong players can grow or stronger players can grow. And, you know, we've started this idea that now everybody needs a bailout. Back in 2008... We bailed out the banks because they got themselves over their head and, you know, bad mortgages, right? And we go back then and we say, well, you know, we can't let the banks fail because if the banks fail, well, you know, it won't be good economically. Of course, the banks are members of the Federal Reserve and, and they were saying, basically, don't let me fail because, you know, I'm too big to fail. And we came up with this whole idea, right? But then as we went along, we kept bailing out. Well, we bailed them out, so now we've got to bail out so-and-so. In 2020, we just said, you know, we're going to bail out everybody. We bailed out corporations. We bailed out cruise lines. We bailed out households. We're still bailing out households. Uh, Joe Biden just announced yesterday that he's going to extend the moratorium on student loan debt through August. We've got... We've got record low unemployment. People are back to work. They can afford to pay their student loan debt now, right? And we're still bailing out homes. But this is, this is the idea. We don't really want to be responsible for the debts that we take on, right? So much better when the government just pays our debt for us. Wouldn't it be awesome? I would love to make that hat trick work. But it just doesn't work economically speaking. But as, I, but as I, I noted in our article from a couple of weeks ago, it's called Bailouts and the Demise of Capitalism. A, 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 the section is titled, Here We Go Again. Not surprisingly, given the Fed created a no-lose environment for speculators and investors, the recent collapse in oil and nickel has led to demands for more bailouts. And this was when oil prices went from like 130 to 100 like over a couple of days uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was that first big kind of blow-off top that we had in the oil market. And, of course, also was the 
nickel market that got shut down for a week or so because one player was so large and started getting margin calls. And this is this is what happens in the commodities market. Now, remember, the commodities market's driven by two types of players primarily. There's there's three players in the commodities or in the options markets, right? There's the there's the the big institutional. They're they're the guys that are, you know, hedging production. So I'm an oil company and I'm buying forward contracts for delivery of my oil at a certain price. So I'm hedging my delivery. Then there's the speculators that are simply just betting on the price of oil. So they're you know buying contracts, betting on prices going up or down or whatever they're doing. They have no intention of taking delivery or making delivery of product. They're simply speculating in the market. And then the third uh, group is your small retail speculators. The, the biggest of the group is the non-commercial players. These are the guys just totally speculating in the markets. And they're the ones that really set price and drive price overall. And so these commercial players, though, you know, they're out investing, making these deals. And then you've got companies like Trafigura, who is out making deliveries and making bets and also playing the financial end of the market as well. They're doing both the commercial and the non-commercial. And they got themselves into trouble. And they went to banks saying, hey, I need, you know, a few billion dollars because I'm getting a margin call. Now, what's a margin call? Margin call is what happens when you borrow money from somebody based on assets in your portfolio. So, for instance, if you have a investment portfolio at, you know, one of the big institution custodians, right? And let's say you've got $100,000 in your account and you're... And we'll just say you're long 100% of your entire account is long Apple, as an example. So you have $100,000 worth of Apple in your portfolio. So if the mar- if Apple goes up, you know, 10%, your portfolio will go up by 10%. Well, what could you do potentially to increase those returns? You're really, you're really, you know, you're really confident about Apple going up. What could you do to increase those returns? We have a couple of options. First of all, you could put some more money in the account to buy more Apple, right? Or you could put some money in the account and buy options on Apple, betting that Apple will go up, and that's a leverage bet. Or you can borrow money against your Apple stock. And so in most you know brokerage accounts, is you can borrow up to 50% of the value of the asset. So I have $100,000 of Apple in my account. I borrow $50,000 to buy $50,000 more of Apple. So now I've got... $150,000 worth of Apple, even though I only have $100,000 in my account, right? So now I've leveraged my account. So if the price of Apple goes up, it's all good. Here's the problem with margin. Now, the math is what we were just talking about. The value of the account. So if I have $100,000 worth of Apple, I can borrow $50,000. So if I borrow $50,000 against my $100,000 worth of Apple, that's a 50% margin line. If the price of Apple falls from $100,000 to $90,000 in value on my account, my margin is now only available at $45,000, 50% of 90. But I borrowed 50. So this is where the bank now calls me and says, hey, you've got a margin call. You need to either put some money into your account to cover the differential. So I've got to put $10,000 in my account to now have $100,000 worth of value in my account to support the $50,000 that I borrowed. Or I've got to sell my account to reduce the value of my account to a level that supports the current margin amount. Now, if I, if I don't, if I don't contribute, now here's the thing about margin that's most important. If I don't contribute the $10,000 to the account, or if I don't sell down the assets in the account to meet the margin requirement, just say I ignore them. The brokerage firms comes in at the end of the day and does it for me. 
they sell down the account. And here's the problem with margin calls. The value of the account fell to $90,000. I have a $5,000 deficit that I've got to cure. So they sell $5,000 worth of my stock to cure that $5,000 worth of the deficit. However, now my account's $85,000 and 50% of $85,000 is $42,500, no longer $45,000, which now I get another margin call, so forth and so on. And if asset prices are dropping at the same time, this begins a fairly ferocious cycle to where I either have to cover that margin or I get liquidated entirely at some point. This is the problem with margin calls. It creates for selling in the market. So in other words, when you start getting this cascade of margin calls, it begins to feed itself because as values are reducing, it's requiring more selling of assets, which is reducing prices more, which induces more margin coverage, which induces more selling, so forth and so on. And before you know it, you've got a wash a washout. And this is what happened in the commodities market. Now, it can happen both sides. If I'm short, and and say, for instance, in the case of the nickel market, this guy was short nickel. He was betting on prices going down, and prices started going up, and it created a margin call in the other direction, right? So rising prices now impacted him. And so this is what happens with all this leverage and all these optionable contracts that are in the commodities market, is that when prices move against them, it moves very quickly, and it creates margin calls. Now here's the here's here's now here's the conundrum that now exists. In the commodities market, commodity margin calls, you know, commodity prices affect both the margin and the delivery. In other words, if I'm getting a margin call but I can't get delivery of the product because of sanctions or whatever else is going on, Why pay the margin? And this is one of the problems that we've got going on right now with sanctions and with things. There's simply not any product available for delivery, which is now creating skews in prices, which is creating potential risk in the commodities market. Like I said, Trafigura already is facing margin calls. The the, The guy in the nickel market was already facing margin calls. These are big players, by the way. And if this starts to spread, commodities players have already gone to central banks asking for a bailout. They're going to central banks asking for a bailout at the time that the banks are trying to get out (laughs) of the bailout game. We come back from the break, we'll talk about what the consequences of this are going to be. Don't go away. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com we're all impacted by the significance of the passage of time especially when it comes to signing up for medicare when should you enroll what's the best plan for you how will the significant passage of time adversely affect your medicare premium join richard rosso and danny ratley for our next virtual lunch and learn on medicare avoiding pitfalls and permanent penalties thursday april 21st register now at real Invest- investmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. 
Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. My one vice in the world is York Peppermint Patty, so <laughs> I don't know who keeps sending me these, but keep doing it. You should at least take a note in so I can thank you for doing it, but hey, you're you're my hero. That's enough so, for the whole office. Yeah, I don't share. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. When you have only one vice in the world, you, no. No. You, I, yeah. yeah, just, you can drool over this. I'll get my own. At realinvestmentadvice.com. Yeah, I'm not sharing. Right. Yeah, sorry. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare with Ratliff and Rosso. Thursday, April 21st. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premium? Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. Welcome back to the show this morning. So we're talking about the next potential financial crisis. And, you know, the problem is, and and again, I'm not trying to scare you into, it's just this is how we're going to refer to things from now on. Every time we have a problem in the market, it's a financial crisis. Um, You know, it's it's just a, it's, it's, you know, problems that we create monetarily through bad policy decision making of just bailing out everything. And, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, each one of the, events we've had over the last, you know, 50 years, 1970s, it was the nifty 50 and 1987, it was portfolio insurance caused the 1987 crash. Then we had the long-term capital Asian contagion problem in 97. Then we had the dot-com crisis in 98. We had the financial crisis and, and, you know, the dot-com crisis was basically, you know, um, you know, dot-com companies and the financial crisis 2008, primarily real estate, mortgages. You know, the next event, you know, we'll we'll figure out what it is. The You know, the problem is that we've got overvaluation in a lot of assets now, whether it's real estate, stocks, commodities, et cetera. You know, we've got asset bubbles in a variety of places this time around. So the question will be is, you know, what triggers – an event that you know causes a ripple effect and don't know what that is. But right now, it seems to me that commodities are really sticking themselves out as the potential leader, I guess, in terms of the next thing that the Federal Reserve and central banks globally are going to have to bail out. Because there's, the, the, there's two problems here. One, it's not just about the amount of speculation that's going on in the financial markets 
particularly in the commodity space, but it is also the impact of an inability to deliver product. There's just simply not enough supply. And that's the problem with liquidity. Liquidity kills you quick. And if something goes wrong in, on the liquidity side of the market, it leaves everybody exposed. And from that exposure, this is where you create large losses. These large losses impact the financial system. And there's, you know, uh, those risks then feed through to the banks that loan the lines. And then we're having to bail out the banks again. And this is why I'm saying is that at the end of every day, we're always having, to, you know, we're, we have these annual stress tests for the banks. The banks are completely healthy. They can withstand a drawdown of 50 percent of employment and, and the drop of the economic environment. You know, talk about a massive financial, you know, dissolution of, of assets across an entire market. And these banks are long billions of dollars in collateralization, loans, et cetera, to a lot of these traders. And so when something goes wrong, and it goes wrong quick, it leaves these banks undercapitalized very quickly. And we have to go in and start bailing out the banks again. So, and again, you know, the commodities market is not necessarily lethal. But bank equity will certainly take large losses. So the question then becomes, you know, where does central bank step in? Well, the ECB just last Friday told basically commodity, commodity traders are already looking for a bailout because of what's going on in the commodities market. And the ECB said no. Now, that was probably a mistake. And what that's, you know, if, if this begins to spread and we continue to have a prolonged period of an inability to deliver commodities, we're likely going to see bigger problems across the commodity space. And if we do that, and if that does occur, and, and, and let me be clear, I'm not saying this is going to occur, right? I, I want you to be really, I don't want you to walk away from what I'm saying today and say, oh, I need to sell everything because Lance said we're about to have a financial crisis. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there are some ingredients here that potentially can set up a financial route. And it can happen very quickly because commodities are very leveraged. And it's a very big market. I mean, you think about all the commodities that we trade every day, nickel, platinum, oil, you name it, right? I mean, just, you know, corn, wheat, soybeans, pork bellies, uh, you know, cattle, you know, all those. Anything that you consume between agricultural and non-agricultural commodities, there are futures contracts trading on that because the people that are actually producing that stuff are hedging their, their delivery and their production. If I've, if I've got, you know, if I'm getting $120 a barrel for oil right now, I want to lock that in, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy contracts to guarantee that I'm going to get $120 barrel oil, you know, for the next six months, eight months, 12 months, whatever it is. I'm going to lock those prices in. Of course, in order to do that, somebody on the other side of that trade has to be betting on what? The prices are going to go down. And see, this, this is the important thing to understand is that none of this stuff happens in isolation. For every buyer, there's a seller. For every option contract, for every commodity future, for everything that goes on, there is a buyer and a seller. So while one person is doing one thing to hedge production, there's somebody else betting against him, and somebody's going to be wrong. And the other problem becomes is that if somebody's betting on oil prices doing X and they're betting on delivery, and delivery can't be made because there's simply not enough product because of sanctions, whatever else there is, this becomes a real liquidity event for these traders and potentially companies and the banks. 
Again, not saying this is going to happen. So don't go panic and drive your car off the road this morning. The, the important thing is to understand is that if this does come to pass, what will happen is that the Federal Reserve, central banks globally, and again, the ECB probably made a big mistake on Friday by not bailing out the commodities traders when they asked for it, but we're likely going to have some type of return to QE fairly quickly, the Fed dropping rates back to zero and launching some type of commodity bailout fund. Because we can't allow people to fail. Let me ask you a question, though. Let me read to you from a Financial Times article from a couple of weeks ago. The FT reported that Europe's largest energy traders, this is Trafigura in particular, have joined the insolvent bank in calling on governments and central banks to provide emergency assistance to avert a cash crunch as a sharp price move triggered by the Ukraine crisis strained commodity markets. Now, this is, this is what the ECB just said no to on Friday. The FT writes in a letter that it had seen the European Federation of Energy Traders, a trade body that counts BP, Shell, and commodity traders Vital and margin call stricken Trafigura as members, said the industry needed time-limited emergency liquidity support to ensure that wholesale gas and power markets continue to function. Quote, unquote. They said no. But let me ask you a question. Whose fault is it that these trades didn't go as expected? When your commodity traders that are working for your bank, company, etc., are betting on certain things and taking bets on long trades, short trades, whatever it is, whose fault is it that they didn't work out the way you anticipated? Is it the bank's fault? Is it the government's fault? Is it the trader's fault? Whose fault is it? And again, now we're talking about the impact of bailouts on capitalism. Do we need to bail out these commodity traders to ensure the proper functioning of commodity markets, etc.? Probably. Probably. But do we do that without a penalty to the company or companies that are involved in the problem? In other words, who pays the ultimate penalty? Is it the bailout? Is it the Fed? Is it the central bank just absorbing assets and saying it's okay, no harm, no foul, go back to what you were doing? No, you made a mistake. It's completely okay. Or do you unwind the trades by supporting the buyers on the other side? In other words, what I mean is that instead of bailing out these companies, we say, well, Trafigur, you know, you got yourself into this problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to help break you up and sell you off in pieces to other players in the markets. We're going to help support the Darwinistic process of capitalism and we'll help unwind you into the markets. And we will allow the stronger players, the ones that didn't get themselves into this problem, to absorb the pieces of you and become stronger players in the market. And we're going to diversify that market a bit more now. This is a pipe dream, of course. It'll never happen. But if we did that, how many players do you think would start reducing the risk of massive losses by not having the moral hazard in place provided by the central banks? What's moral hazard? It's an insurance against loss. Why not take the risk if I'm going to get bailed out? Be right back.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. We're all impacted by the significance of the passage of time, especially when it comes to signing up for Medicare. When should you enroll? What's the best plan for you? How will the significant passage of time adversely affect your Medicare premiums? Join Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff for our next virtual lunch and learn on Medicare, avoiding pitfalls and permanent penalties. Thursday, April 21st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com for our next free lunch and learn to avoid the pitfalls and permanent penalties of Medicare. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Anyone can sell you insurance and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. What worries you about your money? Enhance your financial success with RIA Advisors' free financial planning tool, MyBlocks. It's our online modular manager for your money and your life. Does your vision of retirement match up to reality? MyBlocks can help to determine how much you'll need and how you can achieve. Create your own personal financial vision for the next decade with MyBlocks, our free tool at RIAAdvisors.com. Click on the Client Portal tab, RIAAdvisors.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Okay, welcome back to the show. Of course, uh, we're getting to more fun stuff now. No more financial crisis talk. <laughs> it's, it's only Wednesday. <laughs> this is what happens when Danny doesn't show up. <laughs> you have to pace yourself. I know, right? Exactly. <laughs> Um, so anyway, if you go to the, if you go to the website, if you want to read the article on bailouts and the demise of capitalism and free markets, that was uh, from March the 28th. So just a few days back, it's on the front page of the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. You know, one of the things that, you know, we continue to, to kind of watch here in the markets over the last, you know, couple of weeks is this kind of reflexive rally. One of the big questions right now is, whether that reflexive rally has legs to it or basically have we, you know, kind of run to the end of that? Uh, you know, was it just a bear market bounce and we're now going to retest lows? And again, it's too, it's too early to, to suggest that. There's certainly a lot of negativity in the markets. And that, that's one of the, the kind of things that, you know, is worth paying attention to because as markets work, one of the things to remember is that when everybody's bearish, that's actually bullish, right? This called contrarianism. And right now, we still have a lot of negative sentiment in the markets. People are very bearish about the markets. There's a lot of negative positioning in the markets now. And I've talked about this, and I got a question the other day, and, and it's a good point. They said, you know, well, you're, you're talking about negative positioning in the markets. There's a lot of cash sitting on the books. That means there's cash on the sidelines. That's not true, okay? There is no such thing as cash on the sidelines, right? There's not this big pile of cash sitting out there in la-la land just waiting to come flying into the markets. That's not the way it works. You know, as we talked about before, the mar financial markets are like a, like a football team, right? I can have 1,000 players on my football team, right? But I can only have 11 players on the field at any time. I got a lot of I got a lot of players I can cycle through, but I can only have eleven players on the field. Period. So if I want to take a player out, I've got to put a player in. And that's the same way it works for the markets. For every buyer, there's a seller. So there is never cash on the sidelines. So what I mean by there's cash on books 
is there's a lot of portfolio managers like us that are underweight equities. We've made a conscious decision to have more cash. We've made a choice to have cash in our portfolio model at a higher than normal level. However, in order for me to get that cash on my books, somebody had to buy the stuff I was selling, right? So the, the value of the market didn't change, right? We just swapped assets is all that occurred. But right now, there's a lot of, of portfolio managers, hedge funds, et cetera, that are carrying high levels of cash, which means that at some point, if everybody decides that they need to be back into the markets, that they're going to be asking to swap assets again, which means they're going to have to be a group of people willing to sell in order for all these equity managers to buy. Now, what happens when that occurs? It's a supply-demand game, just like economics. If prices are rising, people go, well, I'm not really want to sell my stock here because prices are going up. I don't want to miss out. But what that means is, is that now buyers are going to have to pay up for prices to get somebody to sell to them. There's always somebody willing to sell something for some reason. But buyers are going to demand higher prices, and that's going to make the market go higher if this cash comes back into the markets. So as, as is always the case, it's simply an asset swap. And as is always the case in the market, it is supply and demand because it's a market. And when there's a lack of sellers or a lack of buyers, either way, you're going to have more exaggerated price movements. So the one reason that having you know, a lot of managers sitting on cash and having, ne- you know, having a, a negative positioning relative to their normal allocation is that is a potential for higher prices if that cash has to come back into the markets. And what would cause that, of course, would be a change in dynamics. Markets begin to move up, and it moves up enough that there's a concern about underperformance. And so these managers start buying stocks in order to make sure they're tracking performance. Because remember, at the end of the day, it's all about performance. That's why it's a contrarian indicator when there's an underweight positioning of equities. And there's actually quite a few of these indicators right now that are out there that are suggesting that the bottom that we saw in March might be a bottom here for a little bit. doesn't mean permanently, but it might be a bottom here for a little bit. So the one thing we're watching very carefully and the one thing you want to pay attention to is we are getting this pullback in the markets over the last couple of days. That's good because the markets had gotten very overbought. And now we're starting to work off that overbought condition. And and the important thing here, as long as the markets can hold above the 20 and the 50-day moving averages, not violate that, work off this overbought condition and the current sell signal that we're in, that does suggest the markets could make another move higher. So the action over the next couple of days will be looking for some stabilization. Now, markets are going to open down this morning. Dow's going to be down about 200 points at the open. Uh, NASDAQ's going to be down um, about 120 points. s and going to be down about 42 points. So that's certainly going to start pushing these indexes back towards that support. Now, we're not there yet, but it's going to push back to those levels. So if they can hold support, not violate that to any great degree, get the market oversold, then you've got a shot for another rally that could push markets back up towards all-time highs. That certainly would not be out of the context of normality, even in the, the, the process of this movement, right? Because all we're doing is, is have been in the consolidation now in the markets, and this is another important point. Markets have just been consolidating sideways now for the last six months, going back to September. We had a false breakout to the upside. We had a false breakout to the downside. And we've just really kind of been stuck in the middle. If you had, if you had bought the market on September the 1st, you'd be basically about even right now. Just going nowhere for six months. Frustrating, but not devastating. So the important thing here will be to see what happens over the next couple of days. If markets can hold support here, work off some of this overbought condition, Sentiment is not terribly negative, and if the Fed continues 
to telegraph and, and kind of just follow along with their path, there's no real big risk to the downside at the moment that's sitting out there. Now, of course, this all is withstanding some potential unexpected exogenous event, you know, a ramp up of the Russia-Ukraine conflict that the market wasn't expecting, another big commodity route that the market wasn't expecting. So any type of unexpected exogenous event will certainly put downward pressure on markets. But again, that's hard to predict for. So again, that's why you just want to kind of pay attention to what's going on here. You know, there's there's a lot of 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 catalyst that suggests that markets could certainly move higher here in the short term. There's also plenty of, you know, concerns between the Fed, higher interest rates, what's going on in the commodities market, et cetera, that could certainly push things lower as well. So how do you play that? See, that's the, that's the challenge. You're right here in the middle of this kind of this no man's land limbo area where potentially any decision you make, and this is what we talk about one sided bets. You know, if you start trying to make a one side bet, I'm betting the market's going to go down. I'm going to be short the market and do all this, and the market runs up for some reason, which markets tend to do exactly the opposite of what you expect. Then you're going to be caught on the wrong side. Likewise, if you go, I, I think the market's going up from here. You know, history says that when the Fed starts hiking rates, markets go up every time. It's a true statement, by the way. Um, you know, I'm going to be all long stocks, and then something happens that blows the market out, of the, that blows the bottom out of the market. Now you're on the wrong side. See, that's the problem. That's why we have to just kind of navigate this right now. You know, we have some exposure to the markets, but we have a lot of cash. We have fixed income, and that's that's our hedges. And so we just want to kind of play a conservative game here until let, until the market tells us what it wants to do. And that's really just that's really just it. You know, rather than trying to guess at what the market's going to do, let it tell you what it wants to do. Yeah, you, you may be a little bit behind the curve, but it's not the end of the world. I can make adjustments. I can always make adjustments, right? But if I'm if I'm on a one sided bet and I'm wrong, it's very tough to unwind that whole bet and get on the other side. It's very tough to do because, A, you've got to admit you were wrong, and that's that's the biggest challenge. You've got to admit you're wrong, and you've got to know you're wrong. That's, those are big challenges. And that often leads to investors hanging around far too long in a position they shouldn't be in because they don't want to admit they're wrong. And they're convinced because of everything they're reading, and this is confirmation bias, we only read information that, that confirms our view. And since we're only reading that information, oh, the dollar's going to zero, whatever it is, when it doesn't, we keep reading everything that confirms our bias that it's eventually going to go to zero, so we keep hanging on that position for far too long. Sometimes we just got to reposition. And we got to say, hey, we were wrong, got to reposition, and, you know, go from there. And eventually we may be right about whatever our view was, and then we'll have to reposition for that again. But, you know, that's the interesting thing right now. I'm getting a lot of emails from people. Well, the dollar's going to zero. Dollar's been rallying like a banshee here lately. Is that going to last? I don't know. But right now, with higher rates in the U.S. and uh, safety, stability, and liquidity of the U.S. Treasury, a lot of people are moving money into the U.S. We've had big inflows into Treasuries lately, even though prices have gone down a little bit because rates have gone up. A lot of inflows into Treasuries, that's strengthening the dollar. All right, that wraps up the show for today. Get by the website. Uh, Michael Leibowitz's latest article is out, and he'll be on the show tomorrow. We'll talk about the FOMC minutes that are being released today. Lael Brainerd and Bullard and what they're saying about tightening of the balance sheet, how fast will that occur? All that up on tomorrow's show. Get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Three minutes of markets and money are coming out. And get our latest newsletter and more. Uh, realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. See you back here tomorrow. It's a rich man's world.